Memorizing the names of each of the little worms in the brain is one of the things a medical student is tasked with. It's no easy endeavor. The reason why it's difficult is that the gyra and sulci all look the same and vary somewhat from brain to brain. The reason why it's important though is that function is consistently linked to location and there are certain features that are almost always recognizable and can help you locate where things are and what they do. That also means that in the clinics, if you correctly identify the symptoms, you can have a pretty accurate idea of what structure is injured, which helps narrow down the diagnoses and employ the effective treatment. But the thing is, how are you gonna remember what is what? Don't you wish it was clearer? <laughs> That's exactly what I'm gonna do. If you take away the non-essential, you can have a very consistent map, and you'll probably be able to identify every one of these structures in an actual brain. The best way for you to benefit from this video is to watch it closely, then look at an atlas, and then try to draw the brain yourself. If you have to, watch the video a few more times until you're able to do it on your own. I guarantee you'll be better for it. Okay, so let's go ahead and do it. Okay, done. Enjoy yourselves. Bye-bye. Just kidding. That's what the drawings are going to look like, but I'm going to take you step by step. Let's start with the medial aspect of the brain, since it will provide a very consistent structure that will also be our link to the lateral aspect. We begin with the cingulate sulcus here, that gives off a marginal branch a little behind its highest part. This marginal branch is important because it helps define the paracentral lobule, which contains the medial part of the central sulcus. If we continue the cingulate sulcus, it ends here, as it's entering the temporal lobe. And from this sulcus, we can draw the all-important calcarine sulcus, going posteriorly, and the parietal occipital sulcus, angling upwards. So if we add the posterior margin of the brain here, we can define the cuneus, which means wedge-shaped, and this area right in front of it, which is aptly named precuneus. Alright, now we can add the inferior border of the cingulate gyrus, and continue on to the inferior margin of the brain. And now we have enclosed the temporal and the occipital lobes. And if we add the sulcus here, called collateral sulcus, and also the occipital temporal sulcus, we have defined the lingual gyrus in the shape of a tongue that's continuous with the parahippocampal gyrus. The parahippocampal gyrus is also continuous with the cingulate gyrus by means of the isthmus, which means connection. Below the lingual gyrus lies the fusiform gyrus, or spindle-shaped, and below it is the inferior temporal gyrus, which also appears on the lateral surface of the brain. This pair of gyri here is sometimes referred to as medial occipital temporal gyrus and lateral occipital temporal gyrus, depending on which text you're following. There's also a little protrusion here, called the uncus, because of its shape like a hook. And finally, we add the antero superior margin, and this area corresponds to the superior frontal gyrus, which also appears on the lateral surface. Alright, let's go to the lateral surface then. We start with the central sulcus. Remember, we saw its tip in the paracentral lobule. It goes around and goes all the way down here. And the other dominant feature is the lateral fissure, or sulcus. Keep in mind that the central sulcus doesn't quite reach the lateral fissure. In front and behind the central sulcus, there are the parallel precentral sulcus and postcentral sulcus, respectively. And perpendicular to the precentral sulcus, there are the superior and the inferior frontal sulci. Let's add now the outer rim of the brain, and suddenly everything makes sense. We have the superior, middle, and inferior frontal gyri. And on each side of the central sulcus, there will be the precentral and postcentral gyri. And we need to add one more feature to the inferior frontal gyrus. There are the ascending and the anterior branches of the lateral fissure that divide this area of the gyrus into the opercular, triangular, and orbital parts of the inferior frontal gyrus. The temporal lobe is really easy. We just add the superior and inferior temporal sulci to delimitate the superior, middle, and inferior temporal gyri. Now, the lateral fissure also has a posterior branch that goes into the parietal lobe, like this, and over its margins you have the supramarginal gyrus. The superior temporal sulcus follows a similar path and it creates, similarly, the angular gyrus. Seen together, the limits of these gyri can be called the intraparietal sulcus, and they define the inferior parietal lobule below and superior parietal lobule above. And lastly, to define the occipital lobe, you have to find the continuation of the parietal occipital sulcus coming from the medial aspect, and also on the bottom margin here, the temporal occipital notch. And that is the end. Now, after you try drawing this by yourself, when you get the chance of looking at a specimen at the lab, or at a 3D model, try to see how some of these sulci wrap around the brain and can be seen both on the lateral and on the medial surfaces, especially the central sulcus and the parietal occipital sulcus. And maybe take another look at this video in a week or so to reactivate your memory pathways.
Don't forget to check out the other videos on the series on neuroanatomy, you can find the links to all of them in the description below. And stay tuned to learn more about mysterious and intriguing subjects that you wish were made more clear.